Welcome to MotivationAddict.com with Julie Salon. This is where you will find inspiring stories on how to motivate yourself and gain momentum towards success, turning fear into confidence, and how to find divine flow, allowing you to crush your goals. Thank you for being here. And now, let's tune in to today's show. Welcome, everyone. I have Kayla Straw with me today on Motivation Addict, and I love talking with her. She is an amazing person. Um, She is actually a jockey and television personality in thoroughbred horse racing, and she began racing in Australia, and then she came to compete in the United States at the racetracks in California. And she is known for her appearances on the reality television show Jockeys on Animal Planet. She was actually born in Adelaide, South Australia, and she was an apprentice and she was always in the top five riders. She won all of her premierships and she was amazing. She eventually racked up approximately 500 victories in her native country and became the poster girl for Australian horse racing. And then she came to America, to the United States, And she's currently, she's not racing any longer. She actually had a son. She actually um, now has a yoga studio, but she has had so many amazing transformations in her life. A very interesting person. So I can't wait for you to hear this interview. She will give us some real gems about courses and really about transforming your life and going for what you really want to do with your life, no matter what anybody says. So. I hope you'll enjoy this. I had a blast talking with her. Kayla Straw, let's go to it. Thank you for being here, Kayla. I am thrilled, everybody, Motivation Addict. Kayla and I are going to be talking today. Kayla Straw, as you know from my introduction, she is a former jockey. She has a yoga studio. She has an amazing journey that she's going to share with us. So thank you for being here, Kayla. Thank you for having me, Julie. You're amazing, too. I am psyched that you're here. I'm psyched that you're here. So let's just start off because this has never happened before in the history of the world. We had the Kentucky Derby just a couple days ago. And because Kayla was a professional jockey, um, one of the horses, the horse that won was disqualified. And so I would like to get your thoughts on this. What did you think when you saw it? And maybe you can explain to the listeners that a lot of them are equestrians, but they're not jockeys. So they're, they're in my spot and kind of just trying to figure out, was that it seemed very uncool what he did. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Right. Well, I mean, horses naturally have that tendency to want to shy away or run out down the lane. Um, you know, the, the last part. And as a jockey, you have to be very, very careful of holding your line because you don't want any excuse to lose a race. And in a race like that, that big, oh my gosh, I don't know what he must have been thinking. Like, just so nervous probably when he, got past the line because he knew that his horse shifted out. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's hard to say, though, coming from where I was raised in Australia with racing and then coming to America, the way that they do inquiries um, here versus in Europe or Australia, um, there's probably a lot of uh, conflict there of how it should have turned out. Um, one of the things that I noticed was yes he shifted out in front of the horse that came up to win and was automatically placed to win once he was taken down but that horse still got away and won easily the dq horse um so he was the better horse even though the other horse was impeded but to be placed automatically all the way back at the end of the line when he was dq'd and this horse move up to win i think in the arguments that they had to put up they probably should have you know, said this horse didn't deserve to be taken all the way down, but it's hard to say um, where they should have placed him. So in Australia, let's say that happens, the argument would have been my horse was clearly the best, but you know he crossed the grounds of the other horse coming, which is unfair. Um, but in the end, if that horse was still going to be a better horse, they should have maybe left him up. But then there's rules. You need to hold your line. Right. 20 minutes so it took them, right? Yeah. It would have been such a tough argument. Like, as you can see, just me just mumbling through what I saw um, and what I know. You need to really take a breath and ground yourself down and then point out, you know, the pros and the cons from both sides and make a real good argument. I guess from where I'm sitting, and I'm not 
a jockey and I don't know all the ins and outs, what I was thinking was we are so lucky that three horses didn't have to be put down because uh, the, the way that that happened, the, the, the winning horse, you know, the, the, the horse that was winning and then the one that was in back had been pushed up and then you saw almost they were just about touching and I just thought, oh my gosh, like when you're going that fast and it was wet out, yeah. uh, I just thought we are so lucky that we're not doing that right now. And I, I don't know, I, I kind of place the blame on the jockey because I feel that the horses are told where to go and controlled by the jockey. Do you agree with that or do you, do you not agree with that? I feel like he probably would have been doing his best to hold that horse straight. Um, because of the amount of money and you know the title of that that race is so huge you want yeah. to win it fair but um you know if you can get away with shifting a little bit here and there because you're under pressure you can do it in a safe way without you know having someone clip your heels there are yeah. tricks yeah but um no i mean the horses sometimes their shoulders will shift out under them when their heads are a certain way Mm -hmm. and their, their body will go there so if that neck area of the horse is not totally in line with their body if you can't keep them pushing forward in the bridle and they keep back contact you know when a horse lifts its head slightly and and it gets away it can just move i mean yeah. you need its full attention yeah and it just looked like that horse didn't want to you know he wasn't really connected with his rider and his rider wasn't connected with him yeah yeah. yeah it was pretty incredible it was uh it was definitely uh different and i don't know if that was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do but i've never seen anything like that ever ever i'm sure you have probably yeah, yeah i mean ever not to that degree and you said like that kind of a race but i was just curious to get your thoughts because you know you've had races obviously and You've, done, you've won quite a bit in the past, so I just wanted to see what your thoughts were and kind of get into the mindset of maybe that was just something that just happened and he, he tried his best and it just, he couldn't, you know? I mean, you, you can't out-muscle them. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been riding. You know, we are one-tenth of even less than that for some jockeys, so, you know, of their weight. So you, you've got to out-ride them with your mind, obviously, but... That's why I think it's very important to have that connection with your horse leading up to a big race like that. Um, I would encourage any rider leading up to that race to get on their horse every day, not just for exercise for the workouts. You know, for the slow, for the slow exercise, you get to know everything about that horse. So if something like that was going to happen, you jump on it before it happens. Right, yeah. right, and have the relationship. Yeah, and unfortunately, it doesn't happen a lot here. Or when you get up to that higher level as a jockey, um, we tend to kind of you know, leave it to other people to help us out to do the, the smaller work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, understand. It, but I like going slow sometimes. <laughs> I like going slow all the time. <laughs> My horse is like, you know, enough with the baby stuff. Let's go. <laughs> no, every, everything counts. Everything's important. Mm -hmm. Everything counts. Everything's important. And all the groundwork in the world, I believe, leads up to and goes into your riding. So it's always good to have um, a baseline and a framework, if you will. I always have believed that. I'd like to talk a little bit about, you have kind of pushed through some very serious struggles in your life. And also, the, the, I'd like to talk about the mindset that you have now transferring from being a jockey into your yoga business now because i've kind of like to give the listeners a little bit of your transformation if you will so would you kind of take us through a little bit of the journey as to how you got to where you are right now running a successful business well like with everything that i've done i've always felt it firstly from the heart and i've learned along my journeys too that the heart is actually one of our thinker spots in our body it's a, a space of intuition it's like a brain and actually we we act a lot off of our emotions and our feelings before our brains put everything into action so you know for my stomach my heart i've always wanted to work with animals so i got the opportunity to do that and i was thrilled um i put everything into it but when you do put everything into one thing i think it is very dangerous at times because the pressure the amount of pressure that you have 
is huge, you know, and then um, to really focus on one thing and not have anything else to back you up if that shall fail or shall go to a low point, you know, it's hard. And I've seen so many of my friends as writers um, get depressed or, um, you know, it's hard. We're not taught a lot about how to handle this huge, um, you know, weight of pressure as a writer, as a jockey. Um, yeah, so I did often see a lot of, um, I, I would say, the other side of things were like drugs and alcohol and partying because it's like instant gratification, right? So um, as a jockey, you're just taught, you know, if you're weight down, you speak well, you go to work every day. Um, and that's about it. And then, you know, you, you win races and people are all over you and they're like, let's go to dinner, let's go party, you're the best, let's have photos. You know, and then you're in the newspapers, um, you're on the TV every day. And then let's say you go through a really good spot and then you just go down for whatever reason. And we don't know why or how, but there are blames that go on to you because there's so much money riding on you. Um, so, you know, I went through the ups and downs and I learned a lot about probably what not to do when you're not feeling well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, besides the nutrition side of things, which doesn't help as a jockey, if you're not eating what you should be, you're going to get depressed very easily because um, you need to fuel your brain and your body to function so that you can think clearly and from a good space. Mm -hmm. Um you know, so I did go through um, a few years of bulimia, which is pretty common for jockeys. You know, just to eat and then throw up your food. It's kind of gross, but and very expensive dental bills later. So I would not advise that if you're going mm. through that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so going from depression and some, some anxiety, because I've always been very sensitive, um, but being sensitive is not a bad thing, I always say, because you can connect to your animals and feel you know, what's going to happen before it happens often. Um, but I, I had that anxiety because I didn't know how to desensitize my sensitivity when I needed to. Um, yeah, so going through racing, it taught me what not to do and maybe opened my eyes up to what can I do to feel more centered and grounded. And uh, in 2010, after I had moved to Australia to write, uh, back from Australia to ride again here. Um, I had a pretty low point in my life when I um, financially wasn't doing well because I just finished the TV show on Animal Planet and it was all about jockeys and I was one of the main characters and that was awesome. But that had just ended and then I hadn't won races for maybe a month or two. Um, and then my partner at the time, I like to describe this as like, uh, we had a Jerry Springer moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> Where, yeah, I was just like, what? I mean, this uh, happened in America. I've heard it, but it happened to me. Uh, relationship wasn't going well. So, um, you know, the only thing that I knew to make me feel better was drugs. And I, I decided I was so down that I would try and, like, end my life. So uh, uh, I ended up in hospital and after that, I actually woke up and I was very surprised. But that day I was supposed to be going to San Francisco relocating to ride. And I had a full book of cards. So I woke up the night before in hospital and I begged doctors, just let me out. I just need to go ride and get back to work and I'll be fine. And yeah, I just, after I woke up, I guess I was just like, that's it. That was really low. And I woke up a different person. Mm. And they let me out of hospital in the conditions that I would go find a therapist and get some medication. So I said, okay, I'll check in with you doctors when I get there and I'll find someone. Um, I rode that day. I got there like an hour before post time and I rode for all the big trainers like Steve and Art Sherman and Jerry Hollendorfer. And it was awesome, but I didn't, I think I won a race that day. Um, but I did go on to have a very successful year that year. That was the year I found yoga, hot yoga, because I couldn't find a therapist. Wow. 
Yeah, I tried to call about 10 different therapists and they're all full. They weren't accepting any patients. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'll try yoga again. And I found a hot yoga studio compared to one regular that I'd tried before. And um, as soon as I sweated, I felt that detox, not only physical and emotional pain, but like all the drugs in me, like everything just came out. Yeah. Fun. And I immediately felt um, relief and lighter. It's like my body was crying, right? When you're sweating. Thank you for sharing that. I know that's very personal and I really appreciate you doing that. Did you feel different when you woke up and went to the track? Did you feel like a different person, a totally different person? And did you feel like you belong there or did you feel like you didn't belong there anymore? Cause you did race a little bit more after that, right? Yeah, no, I raced for until uh, last year, maybe. So, I mean, I still raced for another seven, eight years, seven years, maybe. Yeah. Or, yeah, no, it's 2019 now. So you, since that incident, my memory and another incident after that, I have this like thing where my memory just shuts off. Oh, wow. It, I do have like blank spots. Oh, wow. Um, from incidents like that. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if it's me just, or it's a protective thing that your mind does. Just yeah, of, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Stop things out. But I don't know. I was a different person and, um, you know, a lot has to do with the people around you too. And I just made sure that I surrounded myself with good people. And after that, I was very sensitive of people that weren't good to or for me. I just let them go. And um, I slowly started just to transform into somebody that knew what was good for them. And I didn't want to experiment anymore. Um, I already kind of knew what was not good for me. Right, right. And that's so important that you have the right people around you. And I've learned, you know, probably the last six or seven months that if you don't have, if somebody's taking all your energy and not giving you anything back, mm -hmm. or they're just not a good match for you, you have to let them go at some point. Because... Yeah, you can give them some time. Yeah. Give them a bit of a chance. And yeah, of course. Feel right. Then you just kind of, yeah. But after a couple of years, if... if you know, for me, this person was a very good friend, like a childhood friend, but she always just drained me and never gave me anything back. And it was always one-sided. And I kind of, after my dad passed away, I was kind of like, I looked at it life differently. I just kind of thought, I don't know how much time we have and I want to be happy. And I can't have vampires around that are always sucking all the good energy out of me. It has to be, a relationship has to be 50-50, right? You know, you listen to me, I listen to you, we help each other. And it wasn't that type of relationship. So I, I think that you're right, that you need to surround yourself with people that will help you, but also you need to have healthy boundaries for yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and with you being a jockey, you had so much pressure on you at all times, right? That pressure never let up, did it? I mean, all through the year. Uh, it was constant. I never had hardly a, a real day off. Even when I had days off, I was still kind of, watching race replays, studying the horses and the jockeys and making sure my body was physically ready to do it again. And, um, but the good thing is about animals, when you have animals around you, they kind of bring you back to what's important. So yeah. if, you have, if you keep animals around you too, as well as good people, you have yes. influence of life, life. Like there is life outside of this bubble. Yes. Right? Yes. Like, say the dogs walk me. I don't walk them. <laughs> yeah. Well, horses and animals have been my savior, and I love them more, way more than people. And people always laugh, and I'm like, I'm not kidding. I'm really not kidding. Like, I just, I they help. They just are the master teachers, and they help us focus. And I just try to be with them and enjoy them. And I'd love to get your thoughts on. I'm gonna guess that there usually in the equestrian world there are way more women than men by 99%, maybe 98%. In the jockey world, not so much, right? It's usually men. But I'm going to bet, and tell me if I'm wrong, that the horses respond better to women because they're more sensitive. Am I right? Is that, is that your, your experience? Yeah, and you'll find some males that are sensitive to animals. But, um, you know, in, when the ego is involved and they're naturally 
they're male. Yeah. You know, they hold that essence of male, you know, male, you know, bodies and strength and competition. Um, you know, that is, that's what people thought for years and still kind of thinking here in California, you need to just be strong and you need to shut off that emotion and just ride because you need that. You need the win. Um, that's when the horses start getting injured though, because you know, they're not, um, sensitive to, Hey, this horse has got a sore knee, you know, this is why it's not running. Um, or Hey, this horse is, I could even sometimes feel when a horse's um, blood count was down. So you can wow. take a blood count on a horse and it's, it's tired because it's immune system is worn down from fighting something off. Wow. It doesn't, you can tell the difference because usually a horse is bright and bubbly and then you know, the next day it's quiet and hard to move, you know, things like that. Um, they need to be taken note of and it does, it helps the horse to, to win because you need a healthy horse you know, and a happy horse. Just like you need a healthy, happy human to yeah. win the and, to, and to thrive in life. And yeah. it's the same way with the animals that, you know, we, we need to give them days off. You know, there are people that train every single day and that's okay. And I understand that. And I understand you have bulls, but sometimes taking a day off is huge not just for the body, for the mind, because they need to be a horse and do something. Maybe just it's relaxing and just walking around and just being and just enjoying the sunshine. I know that sounds a little woo woo to some people, but I truly believe it's a lot for the mind. I mean, I can tell you in the saddlebred world, you know, when they don't let them out for all day and they're wearing full sets and they go outside in the sun, they're like this. And I know that's what they want, but that's not really being a horse. You know, I mean, you need them to be fresh and to, to do so they need complete rest, body, mind, soul, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The horses are so sensitive. And I think I spoke about this one time before <laughs> this is going to just go all the way out there, but um, we touch on the chakra points in people yes. energy centers. and when something's off somewhere, you know, we need the energy to flow through it better so that we can have the entire body working as one. Um, and when often some parts are blocked and ignored, you know, it's very hard to kind of get in your flow again and just function. Um, but when you compare the chakra points, the energy points of a person to a horse, the horse's crown chakra, the one that is above the head, that connects us to everything and everyone that is right between their ears and their forehead, where the unicorn horn is often represented. That's like my favorite new thing to tell everyone. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so when you talk about a horse being sensitive and needing sunlight and the environment that it's supposed to be in um it does because you know they're beautiful wild animals so you lock anybody up in a box for long enough they're gonna get depressed and not want to do things yeah and even go crazy sometimes they go crazy oh yeah i'll go crazy if you lock me in the house just for a day uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> what about your mindset if after you've had an injury could what could what tools could you give or tips could you give to the listeners if they have been riding and maybe they've had an injury and they don't trust themselves anymore let alone their horse do you have any thoughts on how they could maybe bounce back a little bit any pointers yeah that's a tough one because everybody's so different and every horse's personality is, I guess, just take your time. Maybe not just get straight back in the saddle. Maybe just spend some time on the ground with the horse and just learn each other's trust again. Yeah. Um, you know, little things like just showing you care and you're not going to punish them for something because the horse is probably going to be scared too if, if he knows that, you know, if you fell off, you got hurt. Usually the, the first reaction is, Oh, you stupid horse, you know, like, why did you do that? And then they're like, hmm, you know, I can't run away right now because I've, you know, got gear on me. Yeah. But they, yeah. they probably would just like, they either nuzzle up to you and say sorry or leave. Yeah, I'm yeah. out. Yeah. 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 You need to find that middle ground again where you both can come to. And often that helps when you're on the ground with them. Yeah, absolutely. Like beer. <laughs> <laughs> I think that taking your time is key and, and everybody's different 
And I, and I think one of the best trainers I ever had said, it takes as long as it takes, right? Yeah. Every horse is different. Every person's different. Maybe you could bounce back in, in a day and maybe it takes me a week. Maybe it takes me a few months. Everyone's just different and injuries are different. And it's always, you know, today's horse is not yesterday's horse is not tomorrow's horse. I always say, because they remember, but yet they don't, they live in the present moment, but they do remember injuries. They do remember accidents. They remember your face. They remember all that stuff. But you as a person also need time too. So I think doing groundwork is always that safe place to be and to start again and then and build back up. Yeah, if you're talking about a horse's injury. I'm talking about a person, like, person injury, but talk about a horse injury as well too. Okay. Um, but so for the horse injury, yeah, definitely take your time. But as a rider, you should be able to feel everything. Um, and I think it's very important to be taught how to feel so, for example, um, you can feel mostly everything when they're trotting at their jog because they're supposed to be symmetrical, like moving, you know, exactly the same, you know, back and forth. So, anyway, when you're rise trotting on that horse, you can either hone in on the front legs or the back from that bounce off of the saddle. Yeah. Um, and you should be able to feel it even. Like, so your bounce on both sides, say you're rising on the right leg, the front right, so that, and then you swap to the left right? Your bounce should be exactly the same. Yes. And also if you're honing in on the back legs, your bounce should be the same. But let's say uh, front right is off. You just pretend your front right or your, we don't have fronts. <laughs> your, <laughs> your right leg, right? Let's say you have, um, you're stepping on like hot coals. Yeah. You're going to hop off of that leg really quickly. If yes. You're sore. So the left leg is going to extend naturally, um, you know, more. The right leg's going to be short, and then you're going to hop off of it. Hang on. Wait. Opposite. Opposite. Right. So. Right. Say your front right is sore. You're going to hop off of the left leg really quickly. Yes. Much easier when I'm doing it. I know. I'm thinking too. I'm like. <laughs> <sighs> You know what I'm saying. Just pretend it is you. You can feel that on the horse. And often the riders will say the wrong thing. That's why the trainers won't listen to them. So it is important to <laughs> say it first and practice before you say it for real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, if it's sore in front, the shorter one, right, will be the one that is not sore. The one that, yeah. There we go. Yep. And if it's sore behind, you're going to feel – like you're trying to lift yourself off of the saddle. There's no bounce. Right. So right. you can definitely feel when horses saw in the back. Right. And then um, you need to be careful though. Sometimes when you have a colt or a stallion that behind is not just squeezing its big huevos. Oh. Because sometimes you'll think a horse is sore, is because it has such big end tires. Oh. Tire. Okay. Right? Okay. So that can trick people sometimes. You have to be careful there. Um, you can feel when a horse is bleeding during a race sometimes or during a workout. And you can tell because when it pulls up from a gallop or a workout, um, it'll have a little cough or a little gurgle. And sometimes that cough will sound like it's got something in its throat. Yeah. And so um, it'll hold its head down low because it's got something, you know, in the back of its throat. Um, wow. Sometimes it'll be pharyngitis from a younger horse because the younger horses often get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's all kinds of little things that can affect a horse, and this is stuff we need to practice. Mm -hmm. You can tell I'm out of practice. I haven't ridden a race horse now for, I think, eight months. So now you so spend all your time full time doing yoga at your studio. Is that right? That is uh, that your passion right now? Yeah, working with the horses and the children and the yoga. So I do still have a racehorse at my house um, on Holly Ground. Um, and I use him more for therapy because I believe that the animals are like my therapists. So I totally get, I totally believe that. As well as yoga. But yeah. they make you get outside. You know, you have this feeling of responsibility and most of the time they pay it back to you. Um, yeah, so it's definitely a good investment to have a big animal, even though they are expensive. 
um, I save on doctor's bills quite often and I'm sure. Yes, yes. me too. Uh, I'm not in my head because yes, I'm the same exact way. Mm -hmm. Same exact way. My father said that. Yeah. He said either we get her a therapist or she gets the horse. And I talk to the horse just like I'm talking to you. And they listen to me and it's my happy place. It's my Zen place. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. So it's, uh, it keeps me sane. It keeps me grounded, right? Because they keep you grounded. They keep you present. You know, it's so funny if, uh, if you're not paying attention, they'll nudge you, you know, with their yeah. nose or, you know, like, hey, did you not come to see me today or what? Like, I'm right here. Like, pay attention to me. It's so yeah. funny the way they talk. And they just, they're such master teachers. They're just, and they're just, um, they're just magical beings. I, I don't, there's, you know, you know, I mean, every, all, everyone that's listening, that's an equestrian, which is probably 90% of the people that are going to be listening, understand as well. Um, I just wish that we could give this experience to others because I feel that, um, and, and I'd like to know what you think, they help everyone. It do, you don't have to have PTSD or autism or MS. They help everybody because we're all flawed. Nobody's perfect. And, and they've recently been saying that they help women that have been abused in, in terrible situations. But even someone who, like myself or like yourself who's very sensitive and takes a lot of energy around them in, they're very much helpful in the being in the present and, and like staying 100% with, with me. Like you're with me now, you're not thinking about yesterday, you're not thinking about tomorrow, you're with them. And you being Definitely. sensitive, I'm sure you felt that as well, right? Oh yeah. And I think because they're such big animals and still able to be so sensitive, that really opens your eyes to the beauty of them because um, they trust us. You know, and, and they want to be able to join, you know, like bond with us in order to be one. Yeah. So when you feel that connection, I think that's when the magic happens. Yeah. When you connect with a huge animal like that, that is gentle enough and accepting enough to have you on their back or grooming them, touching them, whatever. It's just, um, yeah, it's a magical moment and it's definitely worth it worth having that empty pocket sometimes <laughs> it's your awesome heart is full. your heart is so full right yeah exactly that's what life's about right so you've got the horse you've got uh one or two children i have a three-year-old and six-year-old right now <sighs> and two dogs and one foster dog and then i have a pony <clears throat> other than the horse i have two horses okay um i do use the pony the, the older guy a lot for the, the children from the yoga studio here we call our group the crystal kids and um, oh yeah i'm teaching them all about the environment being present and mindful as well as yoga meditation breath work love that um their chakras but i also tell them that unicorn story often and i also show them horse poo and i say the stuff in stores is fake i'm sorry but <laughs> unicorn poo um <laughs> yeah see nobody gets it every horse is a unicorn <laughs> <laughs> oh that's something else that's very helpful right we were talking a while ago about um loving cleaning horse poo it's like a moving meditation yeah um so often yeah when you're cleaning when you're you know just breathing with without a bunch of stuff going on it's uh it's a good place to be yeah and it's just teaches you to be mindful and present because they're so big that they'll either a walk away or they'll nudge you. And I think it is magical that they still forgive us. You know, you can make a lot of mistakes with horses, yeah. even as, as a good owner, you're a human. And I made a ton of mistakes with my horse, but they still forgive you and they're still happy to see you and they still love you no matter what you look like or how you, you know, they just take it all in and they just still love you back which is the magic i think you know that we as humans if you make mistakes we sometimes don't forgive and that's one of the best lessons they can teach us is that you know they just forgive and move on they just forget you know so it's in the past yeah i mean a lot of the horses though they do do that and they're still the same horse but for example like some of them my horse um came from the racetrack and he's his personality has never changed because 
he's always been like a nervous kind of horse. Yeah. And he, he's very forgiving still to me. But for example, his personality, I still want to work with because I don't want him to be nervous his whole life um, when he's anticipating things happening. Yeah. Like the other day, the dentist came to do his teeth. And before the dentist even got there, he knew. And I had him in the cross ties and he was pacing back and forth. When usually he'd stand there, I'm like, he knows. Yeah. Um, so I don't want him to be nervous when a new person comes um, or is coming and he knows it. I want him to, you know, feel safe and feel like he's going to be okay. Um, yeah, so horses, like, it's so funny the way that they behave and they just anticipate and know things. Yeah. But to work on things like that, um, I've been doing some research and there's some pretty good healers out there who work on the chakras and the meridian points in their body. Mm-hmm. And they, they can release that fight or flight mechanism in their body to where it's really relaxed. And then their body is able to heal. Have you seen that? Are you talking about endo tapping? Um, no, but it's probably very similar. Well, the one that I was looking at was like this light wave and it sends pulses to relax these major points in the horse's body so that wherever they're stiff or tight or like their energy is blocked, they can release it. And sometimes it'll even pop out through like their skin. Like Really? One. Yeah. Um, so, there's uh, a really good one. Daphne's Healing Hands, I think. She has a lot of information about chakras with animals. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to look at that. So um, just last week, one of the boarders brought it to our attention, this thing called endo tapping, which I have never heard of. I've seen but, people where you just release by tapping parts of your body, right? So that, no, that's, um, so that's for us. This is for horses and they take a small crop and they put like a little ball on it, but they start tapping at their withers and it's the same type of thing as, you know, we do, you know, all, ta- you know, our tapping, but it's on horses, same type of thing. And they just relax their heads and calm down. But anyway, the amazing thing was once you teach them this technique, you can use it while riding, right? So they show a horse that's you know, nervous. And I have a nervous horse or he's nervous because I get nervous. I don't know which, but maybe a little bit of both. But this horse was starting to actually rear up. Very not good situation. And she tapped him on the withers and he just right down. And I was like, what? Like, so we're going to have a class on it in two weeks. And I got to let you know how it goes. But I started looking at it online. It's amazing. But I think it's the same type of thing. They start on the neck. Then they go to the withers and they go to the, you know, all those points, but they just, I think it creates endorphins in them. And then they just kind of not happy, just happy ones, not excitable ones. And then they just kind of start relaxing Mm -hmm. to the point where this expert, she would just do it in two seconds. They'd be relaxed, like head down, everything. I was like, I need that in my life. It's so cool. And it's so, um, I I mean, I want to learn the right way to do it, but to do it then under saddle. Wow. It, Wow. How helpful would that be? Right? Yeah. It's non invasive. It's it's non aggressive. And uh, I mean I think as a whole in general, the whole, you know, human race is coming so far with connecting with animals and respecting them and then getting the same back from the animal. For for so long there was this like battle and it was always the way that it should be. People said, you know, like men rule animals, right? But in this really beautiful light when you come together and you're able to just like tap a spot on the horse (laughs) or like you know go do yoga and breathe and connect with yourself better uh it's such a subtle level and it's so nice to be there yeah that's when i talk about subtle body you know your energy so cool i mean if it works on humans it's and it works on horses that's i mean I can't wait till the class. I, I can't wait. I'll have to tell you how it goes. But I think that this stuff, like you said, it's non-invasive. It's something that anybody can do once they learn it. And it's not hard. It does, it's like if you do Reiki, it takes years. I mean, you can be a healer on certain levels, but you know, something like that takes a quite a long time. Um, and I, I like that anybody can learn this. You know, you don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to be special. You know, you, you can you can learn a technique that will help your horse. But 
and you at the same time so you can both relax. Because when, if you're nervous, you want your horse to relax. If he's nervous, then I get nervous. And then that's not a good situation when you have a horse and a rider that's nervous. That's just not, I mean, maybe if you're in a race, that's one thing, but normally that's just not, that's not good. Mm -hmm. And they can't learn anything when they're nervous or in fear, right? No, that's not a good place to be. No. no. No, and you want to have fun on your horse. You want to relax and enjoy it instead of it. Like you were saying, you don't want your horse to be nervous every time somebody comes around. You want that horse to be relaxed and happy. And I guess above all, know that he's safe. He's safe with yeah. you, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like um, you want the animal to trust that you are its best advocate. Um, that's what I learned when I was doing therapy animal certificate with uh, my dog. We have him registered as a therapy animal and I did a handler's course. And you are your animal's best advocate, but you want them to know that. Right. If you're around, you will make sure that they are not going to get hurt. Right. Kind of on their side. Um, But I guess some animals don't see that. They just look right past you because they're still scared. And that's where I'm at with my horse. I need to work on him just letting go of whatever happened to him before and knowing that he's in a good, safe place. But um, some animals are more stubborn than others. Just a little bit. bit. And they remember, they remember everything. So it's, it can be uh, a challenge. And sometimes they just get right into that flight mode and they're just, they just want to leave. Like I'm out. Bye. I'll, I'll look later on when I'm way over there. I'll look, but they just, you know, we, we do our best, right? I mean, it's a process and we take our time as best we can. And, but I think having these tools is, that's really cool. You got to keep me posted on that because I want to know you know, how that's working for you. And I, I want to let you know how this endo tapping thing goes and I'm sure it'll be a process. I, but I, I can't wait to, to, ch- you know, check it out and really try it with my horse because I'm sure at first he's going to be like, what are you doing back there? Like, and he'll be, and they say horses get nervous at first because obviously you're tapping them and they're like, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Until you think they, that means like move or get out of the way. Exactly. Usually it means move over or, you know, move your hind end or, I mean, he's good. If I say over, he knows over, but they, they know there's a purpose with it, right? In the past, that's what they've always been used to. So, Yeah. But this is cool that you're going to be able to do it, and it's um, being talked about more than just done by a few people here and there. Yeah. I think that people are starting to recognize this. It's just um, it's so good for both humans and animals. But, you know, we're going to be moving up on another level, another yes. plane, being able to maybe connect even more with them. Yeah. Like maybe soon that whole like intuitive, um, you know, oh, I know what he's thinking will just be a natural thing with us. That would you be know? cool. That okay. would be so cool. It's so possible. I'd like my horse to compliment me when I walk outside in the morning and just be like, you look so beautiful today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love you too. I love you too. Let me know how that works out for you. Well, I'm, but you know, it is cool because when you do have that ability to understand them and listen to them and you, you know, it's cool when you're on them and you're riding and you think something and they do it and you didn't do anything physically. You just thought, you know, like slow down or turn and they do it. I'm sure you've had that experience. That's, that's like the coolest moment because you're in that, your minds are together and you're like a real unit. And that is such a cool feeling yeah yeah it is it's like you're um peg no what is that called like i'm a sagittarius you're like half human half horse there are your legs mm-hmm. yeah no oh, yeah they're amazing so you gotta think positive though because you don't want to be like i think he's gonna stop at that jump and then <laughs> because that, that would not be good <laughs> Oh. I really appreciate you being here, Kayla. I can't thank you enough. I had a great time with her. She's amazing. Um, and I am thrilled that she came. So hope you guys have a good night.